Hello and welcome to the first episode of the Tom Finn podcast. I am Tom Finn and my very first guest is David McGilvery. David is a London-born British writer, actor, producer, playwright and critic. In the 70s he wrote low-budget horror films such as House of Whipcord and Satan's Slave, plus softcore porn. He has recently released a memoir of his life called Little Did You Know, The Confessions of David McGilvery and is currently 71 years old. I first met David when he acted in the student graduation film I directed Bygone Broncos. We talked briefly about this, his life and career, including his long-term working partner Julian Clary, and many other things. I'll come back at the end to explain a bit more about the podcast and my intentions with it, but for now, David McGilvery. I've always had trouble saying your last name when talking to people about you. I always say David McGillivray. Mm, that's how we pronounce it south of the border. Okay. Um, north of the border, it's McGillivray. Uh. <laughs> but when I pronounce it like that, then people leave out an I when they spell my name. So I say McGillivray. Okay. So they have a better chance of spelling it. Right. <laughs> So, um, born and bred in London, and there's a, there's a lot to get through, I think, with you and your career. Um, new book out, uh, Little Did You Know, The Confessions of David McGill, Gillivray. Well done. Um, and we'll, we'll get to that in a moment, but... So, looking through your life... Um, with your writing, uh, writing with horror, uh, the sort of softcore porn side of it, uh, it seems like you've always had a uh, obsession or interest in the sort of depravity. Would that be fair to say? Downright dirty, filthy. It looks it looks that way, doesn't it? Yeah. My feeling is that I was attracted mostly to the glamour. Okay. And I remember distinctly when I was four and a half, I was taken to see the film Singing in the Rain, which is a film about the film industry. Uh, I couldn't possibly have understood at that age what the film was really about, but I, I knew then that I wanted to be part of this world. I wanted to be in films in any way, preferably as a film star, mm. but I would accept anything. And um, my attitude has never changed from that day uh, to this, you know, nearly 70 years later. Um, I, I never became a film star, as you may know, but I was willing, as I say, to do anything else. And um, I think I was still a teenager when I saw my first pornographic film projected onto a, a bed sheet on somebody's living room <clears> wall, <throat> I was fascinated by that. And the first article I ever wrote for a magazine was about my experience watching a pornographic film. Okay. What was your experience, would you say, for the first time? Well, it was tremendously exciting, of course. Um, I mean, not only was I a hot-blooded teenager, but um, pornography was completely and utterly illegal. Mm. Not only was it illegal to uh, produce it and uh, import it, but I was told after I wrote this article that I could even have been prosecuted for admitting that I'd watched it. Yeah. So these are very, very different times from the ones we're living in today where it's possible to just press a button <laughs> on this laptop that is next to me and up comes the paw. Yes. Did you... So was there... When I was younger, there's a thing that boys do for some reason, which is all gather around as a group and watch porn together. Um, and sometimes that would lead on to them enjoying themselves while watching it. Uh, I never understood it, but was that something that happened when when you first started watching porn? Was that a thing people did back then, that sort of community porn watch? I think this male experience ha has always existed. And as I've written a lot about pornography, I've written about <clears throat> these so-called smokers, which existed throughout uh, the 20th century. Um, these were rooms in brothels where men gathered 
to watch pornographic films prior to getting it on upstairs uh, with one of the ladies. Um, so I think this has always go, gone on. I think it goes on to this day. As far as I'm concerned, personally, um, my first viewing of a pornographic film in all male company did not lead to self-pleasuring. Okay. Um, we were all <clears throat> far too um, uptight to do anything like that. Yeah. That would have been really rude. Mm. And it's no accident that the title of one of my books... A history of the British sex film was called "Doing Rude Things." Yeah, I, I I saw something about you not having an education. Was that was that correct, or was that uh, part of the book? I pretended I, I I'd had a, an education all my life. Yes, because I wanted to be the same as everyone else, okay. and so I lied. Or uh, I always used the word bluff. Mm. And uh, yes, this does come out in, in the book. I, I uh, left school because I was expelled yes. um, without any qualifications whatsoever. And although I considered further education, I never got any. So I've had no education whatever, despite claiming that I had A-levels, a university degree at mm. one point. Um, and so on and so forth. I learnt everything I know off the thing behind you, which is a television. Yes. I've always loved documentaries. I've always loved reading as well. And that was my education. It's so it's strange when I heard that because from when I met you, you seemed to me as just like a cl classically trained, uh, well-educated person. I'm acting. But it's acting. <laughs> it's, it's an acting job, yes. Every time you go to an audition, you act as soon as you go in the room. Mm. You have to impress whoever is the other side of the table. And uh, I learned that very quickly, yes. Yeah, well, I, I, when we, if anyone doesn't know, um, we had David in our student graduation film at film school, uh, Bygone Broncos. And when we auditioned you, I think we were intimidated by you the most because you came in and you had this just, we couldn't read you as well as everyone else could, which is what, is that what you were sort of going for? Or is that just sort of the demeanor you give off when you go to auditions? That's, uh, that's interesting because I wasn't aware of it that day. No, mm. I probably wanted to come across as a bit more appealing than uh, you're giving the impression of. <laughs> so I can't honestly remember what I did. Um, I'm interested, though, in what you say. How on earth did I get the job if you couldn't <laughs> read me? Well, when you started acting, it was fantastic. Oh, thank you very much. Um, it, you, you did exactly what we wanted, plus more. Um, so as soon as you, you did that, we were like, fantastic, that's exactly it. And, and then when we actually worked with you, we realised, oh, you're just a very lovely man, oh, and that's that, very, wasn't, that wasn't true. Very sweet of you. It was a very lovely job as well, I Good. have to say. We were shooting in the upstairs room of a pub in Brighton, and mostly it was very, very efficient. You know, mm. I've done quite a few student films, and uh, a lot of them are not awfully yes. efficient. But that's the whole point of the exercise. People have to learn by doing the job. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> get into horror at a similar age that you sort of discovered porn? I think the um, the love of being frightened came much earlier okay. because I was fascinated by the horror films that were being shown in London in the 1950s. This was the time of the Cold War and in Hollywood especially there were a lot of science fiction films. Hmm. Um, about mad scientists creating monsters, often through radioactivity. Um, and I loved the posters for those films. I remember that distinctly. One film in particular called Tarantula. I've seen that, where they, they get the tarantula and they scale it up to that, a huge size. Right? That, that's right, yes. I saw it much, much later. 
um, at the National Film Theatre in London, and uh, it was uh, terrific. Um, it was well worth the wait. There was also um, a series of serials featuring a character called Quatermass on BBC television at that time, and I pleaded with my parents to be allowed to watch this adult material. So I was fascinated from very early on, probably around eight or nine, by um, horror partly because it was forbidden. Mm. And I think you can uh, use that word forbidden um, as far as my entire career is concerned pornography again forbidden yeah. I've always been drawn to things I shouldn't be enjoying before we get to your sort of horror career uh, at what point from having no education to becoming a critic how did that sort of happen yes that was strange it shouldn't have happened because I <laughs> really just didn't have the knowledge at all but I always felt that I could string two words together and this was very useful uh, in between the times um, well during the times I was waiting for acting work hmm. and so as I mentioned before I sent an article to a magazine about my early pornographic experience and because it was accepted straight away I sent um, film reviews to a magazine which existed then called Films and Filming and um, at that time, I was, I think, the youngest film critic in the country. I was 18, okay. you know, with virtually no experience whatever of life, let mm. alone films. But I could, again, carry it off. You yeah. know, I could bluff. And I worked for that magazine until it folded. Bluffing seems to be a big part of this whole industry. As, as, I, as I discover more about it, it's all about the confidence and the bluffing. And I tell young people that when in doubt, bluff. Yeah. Um, never say no to any question um, because a lot of the times when you're starting out, you'll be asked, can you do X? Say yes. Yeah. Uh, have you ever done X? Yes. Uh, because if you say no, that's the end of the conversation. Yeah. You won't get the job. Say yes, uh, try and do the work, if you screw up, never mind. You've still learned something. It's yeah. so much better than not doing the job because of this silly word, no. Yeah. It's, it seems that... Because um, I always had this... My biggest fear of going into this, in the industry is, oh, my God, everyone knows exactly what they're doing. They're going to see right through me. They're going to know I don't know anything. But it seems like everyone has that in them everyone doesn't really know what they're doing and they bluff it until the point where they're doing it it's absolutely true and probably you will never get over this feeling i still feel you know at 71 i'm bluffing yeah i know nothing i don't know how i've managed a career on the little experience i've had and i can see other people as you say with the same thought in their mind what am i doing here How was the transition from being a critic to being a film writer for you? Um, there was a connection, yes, a very, a very strong one. So, as I say, at that time I was um, writing a fair amount for a magazine called Films and Filming. And I went to see uh, the films of uh, a director called Pete Walker, who wasn't very good when he started. But then he made something called Cool It Carol, and I thought this was not bad at all. Um, and I thought I'd like to interview this man because nobody knew who he was and nobody had ever spoken to him. So I engineered an interview with him and we got on quite well. And to cut a long story short, when he needed a writer for his next film, which was House of Whipcord, uh, I got the job. So it was as simple as that. Again, something I doubt could happen today. I was 
quick look at your films, and I, I watched some of Satan's Slave, 1976, and I also watched a little documentary about it called uh, All You Need Is Blood, and there's something about... When I, when I went to watch it, I thought, okay, let's take into account it's 70s, I assume low-budget British um, horror film. Uh, it might seem a bit silly at some points, it might seem dated, etc., etc. It there's something that genre and, and date of, of films, especially um, 70s horror films, that make me feel dirty when watching it. It makes me feel... Things like Texas Chainsaw Massacre, that's the big appeal of that film, is that you just sort of feel a bit uneasy. And I don't think horror films have that, even low-budget ones, they don't really have that vibe anymore. That, would you say that's true? Absolutely true. I wasn't aware of it at the time. And uh, as I said many other times, apparently these films were the products of the age in which they were made. Mm. They were all made in the 1970s when times were tough. And you, you, you probably know that uh, there were a, a succession of strikes and the, the, the government would not um, bow down to the unions. And it looked as though both parties were determined to bring the whole country down. Um, you know, we had the infamous three-day week, you mm. know, when we had power cuts, we had no television after 10.30. And now critics are saying that the films in which I was involved reflected this social unrest. Mm. And I think it's possible life was indeed grubby you know yeah. the dustmen were on strike and squares in london were full of bin liners you know so uh, i think it's inevitable that that's what happened but i can only reiterate at the time all i thought i was doing was writing some nasty horror films in order to give people a scare yeah so it's not a conscious decision to reflect the times do you think no, nor by the directors for whom I worked. Um, it was only much later when some of the films became cults mm. after the arrival of the video age that I read these astonishing criticisms. Yeah. So you were writing these horror films in the 70s and you were also writing some softcore porn films as well. Um, I read that you got a lot of flack from critics from being a critic because of these, is that, do you think it's true? Do you, do you think you've got a harder time for these because of that? It's the poacher and gamekeeper syndrome, mm. yes. Um, the reviews of all my screenplays, not necessarily the films themselves, were absolutely terrible. I, I didn't mind that at all. You know, as dear Oscar said, that the only thing worse than um, being talked about is not being talked about. And mm. on the fly leaf of my autobiography, I list all the terrible things that people said about my writing. Um, I think it's enormously funny. I love reading bad reviews. Yeah, I, I, I've read uh, any times anyone says anything a bit bad, you tend to enjoy it. Well, um, it depends on the person. Okay. A lot of actors, as you know, won't read reviews at all because they um, believe the bad ones and don't believe the good ones. Yeah. Sometimes it's, it's vice versa. Um, I've, I've never had that trouble. I don't think my work is particularly good. You know, it's not Oscar winning stuff. It's passable and it's quite understandable that a lot of people are going to find it quite inferior. Do, do you... I can take it. Yeah. Do you ever have it where, say there's a bad review and they've honed in on something that you yourself had, was worrying about? And then because of that, it then lowers your, um, it sort of brings you down a bit, do you think? Or does that, has that ever happened to you? Because I see that happens to a lot of people, that they get the, someone says something that's particularly been on their mind, so it does get to them. I only l lost it once, and, and that was um, because of the aforementioned um, Satan's Slave. 
And um, time out, uh, and uh, again, I've, I've quoted what he said mm. in my book, um, put the blame for the whole film on my script, huh. which I thought was a bit unfair. Um, the exact words were, um, uh, no, it's no good, I can't remember it. Oh, actually, I could just read it, yeah, couldn't go ahead. I? Yeah, yeah. So um, another absolute stinker from the withered pen of David <laughs> Gillivray. Um, so I did write um, a letter to uh, Time Out um, and uh, they did publish it. And the only reason I wrote that was that the, the critic was another writer, mm. Andrew Z. Nichols, who had ambitions as a sitcom writer. And, you know, to me as a young writer, I thought, well, this is just sour grapes. Yeah. So that's why I was annoyed um, but I got over it, and and now I constantly uh, use that quote in my publicity. I worry about that when I see. I sometimes I see online musicians having a go at other musicians, saying, "Oh, it's just a load of crap and stuff." I'm just like, very think, common. Yes. It's, one, it's subjective, and two, you know, you how can you say that about other people and then get annoyed when people are saying about you? It doesn't seem to make sense to me. There's a lot of backbiting, yes, and I uh, try not to get involved in that, especially today when it all happens on social media. Mm. I love reading yeah. these ridiculous arguments, but uh, I never post a comment myself, otherwise you're you're drawn in yeah, yeah, and yeah. then it can sometimes go on all night and all week. Yeah. Life's too short. Uh, so looking at the documentary for Say and Slave, All You Need Is Blood, I something I loved about these old uh, B-movie films and, 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 and lower budget films today is the what, how you're achieving certain things, so special effects and things like that. And there's the, the shot where the woman's head is smashed through a window and you see this this uh, window that they've taken out and, and, and it's, it's interesting. Do you, is that something that you miss, would you say, in films today? Is that something you enjoyed? Very much so. Uh, I mean, in other words, mechanical special effects, mm. yes. Um, yes, they seemed much more real and impressive because you knew that there was, uh, well, I mean, the whole of filmmaking is trickery. Yeah. But um, it was actually happening in the studio. So um, today, uh, things have changed dramatically because I have a feeling that young people watch films knowing that's not real. You know, yeah. that did not happen in the studio. That happened in post-production. Yes. And I think, as an old man, that takes a lot of the excitement out of uh, filmmaking. Yeah. When I used to go to the cinema and I saw someone being thrown off a cliff into the water, you know, that was a real person. Yes. That was a stuntman who was paid a lot of money to do that stunt, and now it's not necessary. Yeah. <laughs> it's, there's a So with, there's John Carpenter's The Thing, which obviously had the famous animatronics in it, which is still horrifying to this day. Very. Um, and I don't know if you know this, but there was, there was the remake of the thing, the, the third remake uh, in the 2011 or something like that. They made it again. And what happened was they made the, all these animatronics for the, the, the alien. Mm. Um, filmed it, looked great. You can see in documentary footage that it looks fantastic. And then they CGI'd over it. So com rendering it completely pointless. And it's just like, oh, why did you you had it there? Yes. People still want to see real things yes. on the camera because, as you said, you your eye is trained to see what's real and what's not. So, I'm not uh, it, blown away by these long sweeping shots if I know it's all digitally made. Same thing like new shows like Game of Thrones that have these long shots of dragons in the air. I, I know it's not there, so I'm not very interested in it. Oh, well, I'm, I'm glad you agree, yes. But now you make me want to see this remake of The, th <laughs> the Thing. Yeah, well... Just to see... Yeah, watch it and message me how annoyed you are. All right, I will. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's a lot of people my age and younger... Your age being? Uh, 22. You're not. I am 22. How old did you think I was? Well, I suppose you couldn't have been the age I thought you were, otherwise you wouldn't know. You'd know it's 
feasible that you could have been a mature student. Yes. But uh, no, you look over 30, don't you? Yeah, I do get that. You know that. I do know that, which I I rely on. Ah. It's quite good. Well, it it gives you um, stature. Yeah. People will feel more confident about employing you. Before I grew facial hair, my life changed once I grew a beard. It's very strange. It's the beard that's doing it mostly. Yeah, it is. I mean, for for listeners, it's a pretty full beard, isn't it? (laughs) There's a lot of beard going on. There's a lot of. my pride and joy. Oh, it's I'm glad. one of the things I can do, which is grow facial hair. Oh, um, see, I'm not as lucky. No, well, I, 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 you had a lovely mop of hair in the Satan Slave documentary that I saw. True, but um, that was a long time yeah. ago. <laughs> um, but yeah, no. When I, as soon as I grew facial hair, it seemed like people respect you more. I would stop getting asked for ID at the pub and things like that. It's, it's very strange what some hair will do. It's centuries old, you know, uh, beards imply age and wisdom yeah and that's why all the great ancient philosophers have got beards yes it's a great bluffing tool <laughs> it's that bluff again yeah yes it's come back round. correct uh let's jump to julian clary so how did you meet um how did that relationship start Well, my film career ended at the end of the 70s because that was when uh, Margaret Thatcher decided to stop the public subsidy of British films. And that's how all these exploitation films were being made, you know, Mm. with, with government subsidy. So the type of films I was making just stopped almost overnight. So I had to find another career. I'd already formed a a theatre company and we were by that time touring the UK. And we, uh, this is my uh, former writing partner, Walter Zerlin Jr. and I invented a group of talentless amateur actresses and these were the Farndale ladies. Okay. And uh, the Farndale Macbeth was a big success in Edinburgh in 1976, and it led to sequels. And by 1982, uh, I was working for a company called the Covent Garden Community Theatre, which gave a lot of actors their first breaks, including Julian Clary. So that's how I met him. Uh, He was, you know, in the rehearsal room next door. And when I had to fire, an actress from my latest Farndale play, my uh, actress friend Janet said, well, you can have Julian and he can play the part as a woman. Uh, I wasn't at all sure about that, but it was a triumph because um, Julian was fresh out of uh, drama school, willing to do anything. And I think, you know, he was able to hone his improvisational skills Mm. in that play that we did together. Was that something he had done before? Was that the first time he sort of did that female role? He'd already started touring the um, then new alternative cabaret circuit and he was part of a double act with a female friend and they were called Glad and May. And this was even prior to the Joan Collins fan club, which um, many listeners will have heard of. That came shortly after we'd worked together for my company and we kept in touch. And then it seems like you've sort of worked together ever since. How has that, have you managed to keep that sort of relationship going? It's been 37 years, (laughs) which I find very hard to believe. But it's essentially humour that uh, keeps us together. We've got the same kind Mm. of humour and it's based on innuendo. Right. So um, as a comedy writer, that was um, my favourite genre. Um, Smutty humour um, has got a bad reputation, but it um, it takes a long time to craft a good innuendo. So I'm very proud of that skill. And that's been honed over, as I said, you know, 40 years. Yeah. Um, it meant that I, you know, ended up writing Panto, which perhaps I should have done much earlier because I was um, born to it. Yeah. Do you think Panto is something else that seems to get a bad rap 
um, in a similar way as sort of innuendo? Well, that's because a lot of panto is very bad. Right. I, I've seen a fair amount of it. And um, if you go outside the big cities, the, the standard isn't high, um, which is a shame. Um, Theatres assume correctly that um, families will come no matter what. Mm. Um, Panto is the first theatre that a lot of children see, but the producers don't put enough work into these shows and a lot of them are very, very shabby. But when you get to the big cities, um, especially today, the, um, the Pantos are just wonderfully spectacular. And um, I've had the great pleasure of working on the Palladium Panto for the last three years. And they're, they're eye-popping. Mm. You pay a fortune to see them, yes. but the money is all up there on the stage. So I, I saw um, a video of, by, by the way, when looking you up on the internet, I don't know if you know this, but someone else's picture comes up for you. Have you noticed that? Is this another David McGillivray? It is, yeah. He's a sort of younger guy with glasses and a beard. And it's very confusing. There's a few of, there's a few of us. There's a, I think there's an ice skater. Mm. Um, and that one you're referring to, um, yes, he comes up a lot because I think he's a writer as well. Yeah. But it sounds like a very boring one. <laughs> well, so I, I saw some videos of you talking about innuendo and, and ah. things like that. Mm. Um, so... What do you think is so great about the innuendo? Do you think it's, like you said, it's something that people don't take seriously anymore? Well, um, it's a very old art and it ought to be celebrated more than it is. Uh, it exists because of the English language. Uh, we are able to pun much more easily than other countries. Um, so it, it's something that has existed um, well, I always say since Shakespeare, you know, no. there are puns, very dirty puns in Shakespeare. He must have got it from somebody else. So it probably goes much farther back. But, you know, if it's good enough for Shakespeare, yeah. <laughs> it ought to be good enough for us. Um, it came to a head, so to speak, <laughs> in the 70s with the sex, sex comedies and the British um, situation comedies on TV. Mm. Um, it's now become very passe. And whenever people talk about innuendo now, there's a, there's a groan. Oh, yeah. Oh. I, th I think that's a shame. I, well, I grew up, thanks to my dad, with things like the Carry On films, Carry on Cleo being one of my favorites. And yeah, it's, um, and people tend to always make fun of those old carry on films. But if you, if you try, if you watch someone try to do what they did, they can't do it. Uh, it's a very specific way. And they had some, obviously, some fantastic writers and actors on it. But I think it's fantastic, some of them anyway. They were very funny in their day as well mm. and very shocking because yeah. they were so rude for, for that period. Even in the 60s, they were very dirty, but a lot of the jokes got through because the censors didn't realise what was being said. Yeah. That's another wonderful thing about innuendo. Um, Spike Milligan used to slip a lot of very dirty jokes into the goon show because the BBC didn't know what he was talking about. Yeah. Um, he had a character in early editions of the show called Hugh Jampton. Now, this may need explaining because okay. it's a reference to Cockney rhyming slang. Okay. So Hugh Jampton is in fact Huge Hampton. Right. Hampton Wick being prick. Okay. <laughs> so it's remarkable that that was on the radio yeah. in the 1950s. Uh, it seems as well with things like uh, carry on films and uh, Monty Python that a lot of the reason especially young people watch them is that they get to see breasts or nudity on TV um, and in film is that something that uh, you that happened with you as well yes well every, everything goes together you know um, toilet humour and nudity yeah um, that's what I wrote about uh, a lot in my book Doing Rude Things because I was interesting in I, I was interested in the history 
i.e. this love of uh, dirty humour comes from the Seaside Postcard and Music Hall, which didn't have as much censorship as the theatre in those days. So um, this came to fruition in films like the Carry On series, as you say, uh, written by one particularly talented man called uh, Talbot Rothwell and acted by these these wonderful comic actors and when they started to die off and indeed Talbot died that was the end of the series mm. they couldn't be replaced it was a, a thing of its time so as you mentioned there uh, you wrote a book called doing rude things um, which is about the history of the British porn industry yes uh, what led you to writing that well, I'd already written it as, um, I think, a four-part series for a magazine. And then much later, I think 10 years later, a publisher happened to just find those four articles and said, would you like to develop them into a book? Um, well, as we've established, I always say yes. yes. I'd never written a book before, but I thought, mm, yes, I could do that probably. And um, uh, the film, uh, the book was a modest success, yes. It was the first time that these films had been taken seriously. Yeah, yeah. Which, like we've been saying, seems to be something that happens a lot with many things in the industry is things not being taken seriously when they should. Especially uh, in this country, yes. Yeah, I think the sex industry is something that definitely should be taken seriously in many respects. More so now. yeah. Why would you say that? Well, it's uh, there's a new respect uh, for uh, prostitutes to the extent that they're now called sex workers. Mm. You know, it's a job like any other. Right. There's a lot of documentaries, and I watched another one this morning yeah. about the sex industry. Um, this was never the case while I was growing up, you know, the, the BBC especially would never have countenanced anything which seemed to give publicity to dirty matters. Mm. So, uh, your new book, Little Did You Know, Confessions of David McGilfrey, why now? Why did you decide to write it now? I had a feeling that around the turn of the 21st century, something else was going on while um, everyone seemed almost supernaturally obsessed with the end of a thousand years. And uh, we were, you know, gathering under a, a dome in Greenwich. And um, I knew something was going on actually because it was going on in my house every Friday for something like five years I was hosting some very wild parties indeed mm -hmm. and so I wanted to write about this sort of undercurrent to the uh, turn of the century and I, then I thought well I'm about it oh well I might as well write about my entire life and, uh, and that, uh, that is what happened. Uh, it's, it's been gestating for a very long time because it's a somewhat controversial book and it was uh, with a whole succession of publishers who then decided that the world wasn't ready for my memoirs. And um, so it finally never came out until this year um, because, and that was only because of one particularly brave publisher called Fab Press. I I put it on the shelf. I thought, oh, well, yeah. I'll leave it then. <laughs> what, what kind of parties are you talking about? Well, we're talking sex and drugs, Tommy, right. inevitably. <laughs> I mean, what else could I possibly be talking about? Um, it seemed as though, you know, it was, it was a phase that I was going through along with um, most of my friends at that time. And we were behaving pretty badly. But uh, having said that, I have absolutely no regrets whatever. And I think this comes out in the book. It was something we enjoyed enormously. Mm. I was hosting what I liked to think of as salons, you know, in the grand style along 
the uh, precepts of Lady Ottoline Morell. I don't think she was snorting cocaine, <laughs> but uh, we certainly were. Yeah. But at the same time, you you know, we were discussing art and politics and religion mm. and the latest uh, gallery opening and what book we all ought to read. Yeah. Um, and these uh, parties, which, you know, sometimes went on for 24 hours, were just absolutely wonderful mm. and a wonderful... Uh, opportunity for people of all different all different walks of life to come together. So there's nothing in your past that you would change at all. Um, absolutely nothing, apart from um, when I was at school, there was a particularly sadistic history master, and I wish I'd hit him. Mm. That's the only thing I'd change. I know what you mean, though. There's, there's, um, there's certain teachers that you just like. Oh, why didn't I stand up for myself? Why didn't I do something? Especially when you get older and you realise, oh, I wasn't in the wrong. I was just a child. I wasn't in the wrong in this case. You know, he was physically violent mm. and he would hit people, which would now uh, mean that he would go to jail and yeah. quite rightly. And I just stood by while he behaved like this. I was due to be expelled anyway, mm. and so I might have been—I might as well have been uh, expelled for something uh, for which I could have been proud. Yeah, um, for hitting this little bastard <laughs> and giving him something to remember as well. Yeah. So um, uh, I will always regret that, but nothing else. No, I've had no, no. a wonderful life. It sounds it. I've thoroughly enjoyed it, and I wouldn't change anything. Well, I look forward to reading your book, and it's when is it out again? It's in the shops oh, from it is. August the 1st, okay. but now I believe it's available uh, as a pre-order at fabpress.com. Right, well, there you have it. I hope you enjoyed listening to that as much as I enjoyed talking with David. Um, as I said, I'm Tom Finn, a young creative starting out in the film, TV, entertainment, video world, whatever you want to call it. Uh, and I thought, why not chat to people who are in the industry, who I find influential or inspiring, and uh, maybe myself and you, the listener, could learn a few things, or if not, just enjoy a nice conversation with some interesting people. Anyway, uh, if you did enjoy this, please give it a share. I've got some more guests lined up, so hopefully we'll get another one out to you guys soon. Anyway, thanks to Luke Perrett for his lovely music and to Toby Morgan for his wonderful graphics. Um, check out their social media pages for more of their stuff. Uh, but for now, thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.